Well, we're getting another snowstorm. Um, we're supposed to get six to eight inches, I think, in this one. Uh, further south of here, they're getting absolutely pounded, but um, we'll see. It's supposed to snow uh, the whole day today into tomorrow. But I just got back from town. I got some lumber, and I'm going to be wrapping up the loft. So I'm going to be extending the knee walls, the full length of the cabin. And then I have paint to paint the floor. Um, I have some lights to install, a couple other little odds and ends, but um, it'll be a fun project. I'm really looking forward to getting that done. Well, let's head up in the loft. I'll show you what I got going on up here. Still messy. I'm kind of going through everything and organizing stuff, but we're getting there. I got this whole half done, so the knee walls are done on this side, except for paint. Um, but by the end of the day, all this stuff will be out of here. It'll look nice, and the floor and knee walls will be painted. So it'll be quite the transformation. And then I got this half framed up as well. But anyways, I'm going to go outside and rip uh, these last sheets. They're three foot tall. And then uh, get this sheeted in, get the rest of this stuff put away, sweep up, get it spotless in here, and then start painting. So this is obviously an eight foot stretch here, but um, the way I have it laid out is you can you can reach you know halfway across from in here. And there's actually quite a bit of space. Like I mean, I could crawl in here if I wanted to if there wasn't stuff in the way. Um, but you can access everything in the middle from both sides. And this is Sierra's half. She's gonna have to organize this. But the way I did mine was, you know, everything that's important that I use all the time is like right by the door, obviously. And then stuff that's kind of, I don't really care about too much is kind of buried in the middle, but I can still access it if I ever need to. But these knee, knee walls, I think are the way to go it's in a loft like this, because you can't really use this space anyway. You know, you can't like, it comes out perfect where you can kind of kneel up against the knee walls, but the rest of this is, is basically just wasted space if you don't do this. Um, plus, with knee walls, you do it, you are supporting your rafters too. Not that a 12-12 pitch really needs it, but it does add some, some reinforcement to your rafters, which is always good, I guess. But um, anyways, it just, it neatens it up so you don't have stuff just, you know, stacked against the sides. You have everything tucked away uh, nice and neatly. And then these cubbies will more than likely add doors, or for sure, will for sure at least trim it out so it looks nicer after it's painted. Um, but doors would be would be good too. Um, it would just neaten it up a little bit more so you can't see what's in there.
Oh, I also, um, if you guys remember when I extended the loft the full length, when I put that center wall in, I, had, I added two kitchen lights, so I have that wire ran all the way to the panel now, so we can hook those up. So that'll be nice. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start painting the floor. I'll do the floor first and then do the knee walls, but I'm going to work my way this way. I still have some totes of stuff I need to go through here, so I'll paint that, let that dry, and then move this stuff over there and then paint the rest back towards me. So this is uh, chocolate mousse, I believe, is what color this is. Something like that, something mousse. Brown. I'm gonna paint it with this, but we'll probably do something else besides just have this OSB be painted brown. Whether we do like a rug or some sort of cheap carpet or we thought talk about them make that foam snap together flooring. I um, might do that too, but I was getting, I was for sure painting the knee walls, so I figured as long as I was getting paint for that, I might as well just do the floor too. So here's where we're sitting with the loft. We just have those totes back there to go through. Sierra's home now, so we can go through those together and get the rest of that stuff put away. Um, but yeah, the knee walls are pretty much done. I will add doors to these at some point. And I did run out of paint, I was so close. I'm about a pint short. But I'll probably get a gallon because I could touch up a couple spots that are lacking paint. But anyways, there's a lot of space up here and it's definitely nice having this open. So yeah, a little bit of trim work, gotta put these boards back up, and yeah, she's about done. So the loft is pretty much set up. I just have a couple trim boards to, to throw up and then some touch up paint to do with the brush uh, to fill in a few spots that I couldn't get with the roller. But I wanted to give you a, a gauge on, on size and how much headroom you have up here. Cause I know a lot of you guys are designing cabins or gonna be building one. So this, like this cabin's 20 foot wide by 32 foot long with a 12, 12 roof pitch. So this is what it gives you for headroom. Having, being able to stand up, I mean, there's there's a ton of room up here, um, and it's like having a whole nother story to your cabin, so 
Um, we're gonna leave this open at this point. Uh, we're gonna get, get like some furniture up here and, and deck it out quite a bit more. Um, but then when we have kids, I mean, this could easily be two bedrooms. You know, if you did a, a like a center wall here, I mean, that's this is two. This is bigger than my room was when I was growing up. So um, pretty good, pretty good amount of room up here. So I'm pretty happy with the. the and then, as you guys saw, I added the kitchen lights. So those are hooked up now, which makes a massive difference. So those are centered in the kitchen, and yeah, they add a lot of light to the kitchen, of course. Because um, all we had before was just this one light, so when you were cooking or doing food prep over on this wall, you were, you kind of, you know, it was shadowy. Um, so last night was our first night cooking with uh, with these lights hooked up, and it was, I mean, made all the difference in the world. So definitely nice having those done. So I'm going to do a little Q&A at the end of this video. I did a community post on YouTube a couple weeks ago and said that I had one coming up, so a lot of these are from that post. And I'm not gonna get to all of them. I mean, there's just no way. So if I don't answer your question, do not take it personally. I'm just picking random ones, but um, I did heart every single post on there. So um, I read it and I will reply to the ones that I don't um, re reply to on this uh, video. But first question from Suzanne. She says, uh, why are you maintaining two cabins? Why not just having and taking care of one, improving and making one nice and comfortable? Uh, do you not find that it's a waste of energy and time slash money consuming? Take care. Love you guys. Thanks, Susan. We love you too. Um, we have, so the two cabin things is, um, I guess, well, first of all, I don't look at it as a waste of money at all. Cause I think land is a really good place to put your money. So because that land was raw land and there was nothing, um, I got it for really, really cheap. And now that I have, I mean, I've done a lot of work to that place, to that property. You know, I got the legal access to have a trail into it. So that's done. Um, I have, you know, an actual address for that property, believe it or not. Um, I have, yeah, I cleared a building site. I built a cabin. So I've made improvements to that land. So it's not all for nothing. You know, at any point, if I ever wanted to sell it, I would make a decent profit off it because I put in the work. You know, I've, I've improved it a lot since since it uh, the way it was when I bought it. You know, it was just raw land, like thick woods, a lot of underbrush. And yeah, now it, it has, uh, it's set up, you know, for rustic cabin living. Um, so I don't think it's a waste of time. And I, I like being nomadic. I don't like being tied to one place. I like being in the woods. That cabin is very remote. It's hiking only, of course. I mean, there's nobody out there. Um, it's awesome. It's like true wilderness. You know, I have moose that walk right up to the front door. Um, there's bears around. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. And uh, it's a really good area to hunt in, you know, grouse hunting and all that. Um, but mainly we're just in that area so much because the Boundary Waters is right there that to me, it's not a waste at all having property there because we use it and use it a lot. Um, and then, and then uh, so after that, Sierra and I stayed in that cabin. We lived in that cabin for a while, but then it was obvious that, you know, like we were never going to be able to, you know, raise a family there, or do, you know, some things that we wanted to do down the line. So we wanted to secure another piece of property that was not as far out, you know, one that we could actually drive up to and then set it up a little bit nicer. So down the line, you know, when we have kids and have a family, you know, we have that kind of secured. Um, so that's what this place is kind of about. This is our, our main cabin that we live at, spend most of our time here, but then we spend a significant amount of time at the log cabin as well. So, um, I don't look at it as a, as a waste and yeah, I guess we're just nomadic. We like, uh, bouncing around. This one's from Mountain 10 Hunting Club. He says, any movement in the cabin foundation so far? I'm in the process of building my cabin and use your cabin build videos as a guide. So I'm curious if you've had any frost heave. Thanks. I have not had any, they're still sitting, I mean, I haven't, I guess I haven't went and put a level on them or anything, but I'm underneath the cabin quite a bit because I have stuff stored under there and we have, uh, we have our stove hooked to a 20 pound propane tank instead of a hundred pounder, uh, just cause I like, you know, I have those laying around and they're just so easy to grab and tote around and, um, yeah, just go get them filled. So, um, I have to switch those out, but once a month, month and a half, depending on how much we're here and how much we're using the stove and oven. But yeah, I haven't, uh, all the beams are resting on them still and they all look same as they did uh, when I installed them. But maybe this spring I'll do a, a follow up and show you underneath there and uh, we'll have a look at them and see what kind of movement there was, or if, if there's been any, uh, like I said, to the naked eye, I, it doesn't look like there's been any at all. 
Um, but uh, this spring will be two full years of you know freezing and thawing so we can get a, a gauge but um, they still look good I'm always keeping an eye on um, on them and yeah I, I haven't seen anything alarming yet so a big reason that we did our uh, foundation that way and just put it on blocks is when I got my permit for the cabin they said so they asked what kind of foundation I was doing and and because uh, you know you can do like you can pour a slab um, and then build on top of that you can do sono tubes and all that but if you were doing any digging or pouring a slab, then you had to have it like inspected. And it was like a little bit more to the permit process. But if they're like, yeah, if you're just gonna throw it on blocks or cinder blocks or whatever, and not do like any digging or pouring any concrete, um, then it's like not a big deal at all. So I was like, all right, I'll go that route. Um, and I felt pretty comfortable doing it because my grandpa has a, a cabin that he built like 60 years ago that's been sitting on just chunks of railroad ties for that entire time. Um, so that, that never had a permanent foundation. It's just sitting right on the ground, basically, with uh, railroad ties on all four corners and then one in the middle. And that cabin is a 16-foot by 24-foot cabin. And, yeah, there hasn't been any issues with that. I mean, it's settled a little bit, but no matter what you do, a, a building's going to settle. And, you know, at any point, if I needed to adjust them, it's not that big of a deal. You know, you just put some bottle jacks underneath each beam and just lift it up a little bit, and then you can shimmy it and adjust it if you need to. Um, I don't know when I'll have to do that. I'm sure at some point down the line, in like 10, 20, who knows, years, I might need to, you know, adjust a couple of them here and there. But that's not a big deal to me. I, I like projects and having things to do. So, uh, anyways, I did it that way. I'm not saying that's the way to go. It's Definitely not you know, like the best way to go, but uh, it's worked out for us so far. Um, Kyle asks, how far away from civilization are you? Meaning how far do you have to travel for groceries, hardware, banking, etc.? cetera? Um, this, this place here, we're about 30 minutes from a town, you know, like a town of like 10,000 people or maybe a little more. Um, but yeah, it has like a Walmart, like has, you know, it's a, it's a town. It has grocery store, hardware store, you know, banks. Um, that kind of thing. So about a 30 minute drive um, from this one. The log cabin is, yeah, way farther out. Um, I mean, there's a really, really small town that hardly has anything. That's probably uh, like 30, 40 minutes uh, drive from the, the log cabin parking spot. Um, but if you want to go to like an actual like town that has kind of everything, then you're looking at like hour and a half drive. But there's like little tiny towns kind of scattered around you know that have like you know a gas station or a you know post office maybe or a little grocery store or something um but yeah this place is not like i would not consider this cabin remote um like we're rural like we're we're way out we're out of out of town um but there are people that like live in our area so this isn't like wilderness but there's a lot of national forest land around us so you do feel like you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere um especially during the winter here um, but like I said, you know, this is cabin country. So like there are people that have cabins around here and like there's lakes around. And so during the summertime, um, on the weekends, it is a little more busy around here. Like you'll hear like four wheelers and stuff, or, you know, like people buzzing up and down the road or people going to their cabins. Um, but typically during the weekdays, it's pretty quiet out here. There's only like a handful of of us that live like year round in this area and the rest are all like cabin owners um, or people that have like hunting land and then come up, you know? Um, so it's pretty quiet here and you feel like you're you're far out, but yeah, I wouldn't consider this property remote. It's like, you know, country living. You know, we're far enough away from town where we have privacy, we can do whatever we want. You know, we can hunt right here. I can like shoot guns if I want to in my yard. Like it's, we're out and, and have uh, a lot more freedom out here. Uh, Carrie asks, how old were you when you first became interested in wilderness living? Um, I don't know. I, I remember, I don't know how old I was exactly. I'll say around 12, maybe I saw Alone in the Wilderness, um, the Dick Prenicky documentary. And ever since I saw that, I mean, that's what definitely like planted the seed. And I always kind of had it in the back of my mind, like, that's the way to go. Just go out and build a little cabin in the woods. And then, you know, you had, like just just watching that documentary it just seemed like that was like that really called to me like just a guy building his own cabin like mortgage free like like really simple you know not a whole lot of money and then just yeah being happy and living in the woods and enjoying the simple things and not 
participating in the rat race and going after money. Just, you know, being content with, you know, a pretty simple life. Uh, that's always been of interest to me. But, but I've always been interested in the woods and, you know, like camping and like hunting and fishing and all that. I've always liked doing that stuff. So I always knew that was going to be a part of my life and that when I became an adult that living in a city or a town wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I, I want to be out and have freedom and, you know, um, yeah, just freedom and quiet. I mean, like, like where we're at up here, it's, it's awesome. I mean, there, there's so many like things that you can't really even describe how it is unless you experience it. Like for, for example, the, like there's no light pollution. There's no noise pollution. Like when you go out at night and look at the stars, I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, you can see the, the Milky Way with the naked eye. Um, we hear wolves howling all the time. Like lately there's been wolves howling all night long, uh, like right over here, like very close uh, to us. Um, you know, we get like hoot, like I fall asleep a lot of times to like hoot owls, like, you know, hooting out in the woods. And yeah, I just like being around nature and I think that's good for the, the soul. And Sierra loves it too. I mean, she would agree. Um, I wish she was here to be in this video, but um, like after living the way that we have and being like out of town and living rurally, she says like, I could never like live in a town again um, or a city or anything. It's just, you just have so much more freedom being out of town. Connie asks, what is your favorite meal to cook when you are off grid, either on the wood stove or over an open fire? Well, in my experience, everything tastes better over uh, a fire. Like open fire cooking is the best. Uh, but I would say, I don't know, we do, we cook a lot of stuff over the fire. Um, like a good ribeye steak is awesome on the fire. Pretty tough to beat that. Uh, that's the first meal that we always do. Like when we go camping, like in the Boundary Waters is we'll do ribeye steaks the first night, just cause it's so fun. It's something to look forward to, you know, kick off the trip first night, big juicy ribeye steak after working hard all day, uh, nothing better. But yeah, we do a lot of chicken on the fire. That's really good. You know, burgers, brats. Um, yeah, anything anything tastes better on the, on the fire. And then uh, as far as on the wood stove goes, we like doing roasts, stews, soups, you know, cause the wood stove is just so good for like setting a kettle on it and then just walking away and letting something simmer all day, you know? Um, so soups and stews are, and roasts are really good on the on the wood stove. Um, Hokey1021 says, how did you and Sierra meet? Um, and when you harvest your garden and hunt for game, do you ever dehydrate your bounty or make uh, jerky? Uh, Sierra and I met in high school. So we're high school sweethearts, known each other a long time. And as far as garden stuff goes, we don't dehydrate anything there. It would be fun to experiment with though. Um, but we do make jerky out of our deer. You know, we, we do that quite a bit. We didn't make any jerky this year. Um, but yeah. And my dad has one of those like nice grinders that has like, you can make sausage out of it. Like, so we'll do like breakfast sausage sometimes. Um, yeah. Jerky, you know, you can do like summer sausage and those things. Um, you can do sausage links. So yeah, we do, we do that stuff. And that's nice. Cause a lot of times like with, uh, with deer hunting, like we, and we butchered ourselves, we always have, and we do a lot of burger and it, it kind of gets boring kind of having like, I mean, you can do a lot with burger. It's really versatile, but having, you know, like jerky or sausage is definitely nice because it gives you a little more variety. But, uh, this year, so we bought that, uh, that cookbook from, uh, meat eater, Steve Ranella, and when I butchered up our, my deer I got this year, it, it took me a lot longer because I was following this cookbook and I wanted to do a lot of the cuts that he, he does, you know, cause that, so then I can follow the recipes. So I did a lot of stuff that I've never done before. We did like a neck roast, um, which normally I would just grind that up and, and throw it in the burger pile. Um, we did a blade roast. So like the, like the, the shoulder blade, um, we did a blade roast that was excellent. Um, and normally again, I would just trim what I can off of it and throw it in the burger pile and, you know, grind it up and package it. Um, so it took me a little bit longer to kind of, you know, do things according to this cookbook, but everything, I mean, if you're a hunter that like, I highly, I highly recommend uh, his cookbook. Everything that we've had out of there has been awesome. Uh, Renee asks, okay, I know this is corny, but have you ever had a Bigfoot encounter? <laughs> I have not. No, uh, I don't. 
Um, I know there's a lot of people that believe in Bigfoot, but I, I personally do not. I'm pretty open-minded though. So, I mean, if I saw one or whatever, I wouldn't be, can't say I'd be all that shocked. But yeah, I don't know. I spend a lot of time in the woods and I, you know, know people that spend a lot of time in the woods and I read a lot about people that, you know, trappers and mountain men and Native Americans. And all, I like, that's the kind of stuff that I like reading and studying and stuff. And yeah, I, I you never come across anything about Bigfoot in, in those books, but it's possible. It's definitely possible that uh, he's out there, but uh, it's the last thing that I worry about out in the woods, that's for sure. Uh, Barbara asks, how far apart are your cabins? Uh, they're like, I, if I leave, I can be at the log cabin in about an hour and a half. It's not that far mile-wise. It's like 65, 70 miles from here, but it's it's uh the to, to get to the log cabin it's all like it's like four-wheeler trails and gravel roads with big potholes and it's just, they're just it's just rough roads so i mean you can't really get the truck over like 10 15 miles per hour so it just takes it's just tedious getting back there but distance wise it's not that bad actually um but yeah about an hour and a half sometimes two hours but yeah it's not that it's not that far distance wise it's just tough getting tough going getting back in there sometimes you know Dilly Boy says, what's the longest you could stay at your cabin without leaving? I don't know, until the food ran out. Uh, we don't, uh, Sierra and I, like, we don't prep or anything. Um, I mean, really, like, we, I don't know, we just kind of use common sense, you know, like, we have food here, uh, quite a bit of food. I'm sure we could live quite a long time without going to town um, if we had to, um, but... Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know. But the way this cabin is set up is, you know, like we don't have grid power. Uh, we don't have plumbing or anything. Like we're not reliant on anybody but ourselves as far as like how the cabin operates. You know, like we heat with firewood. So everything that like all of our systems, like for getting water, power and heat, they all come from right here. So we don't, we're not reliant on the outside for anything. Like we don't pay a gas company for our heat, you know? Um, I, I guess I have propane stove, but that's like, we don't need that. It's just a convenience thing, but we're not reliant on it. Like it wouldn't be the end of the world if that ran out. Um, there's lots of ways to cook, you know, it's on a fire or on the wood stove or whatever, but, um, yeah, we could stay a long time. Uh, I don't know exactly, but we're really independent here. Like the way when people ask like, oh, like how self-sufficient are you guys or whatever, we're not 100% self-sufficient. I don't believe anybody in the world actually is. Like, you still need other people for things. Um, but if, put it this way, if the world ever, like, went to crap and, and it was like the, you know, if things hit the fan, as people say, um, Sierra and I, like, nothing would change here at all. Everything would, like, life would go on just like it is right now because we're not dependent on anything from the like the outside I guess or town really to to live our day-to-day -day life and go about our tasks other than like yeah we go to the grocery store and get food you know um we don't you know we don't uh eat nothing but wild game like we'll buy some meat from the butcher in town um but if we had to like stay if, if it ever got to that and like we had to stay here we could stay a really long time and if it came to where, you know, you could, where I had to hunt or fish, I think we'd do pretty well. Uh, so here's the thing with like living, like I think a lot of people with off-grid living and self-sufficient living is they, a lot of people have it like in their mind, like, oh, I, I'll just go out and I'll hunt all my own food and, and fish and, you know, I grow my own garden and all that. And, and, you know, I don't need any, I don't need any contact with anybody and just be 100% self-sufficient. Well, with hunting and fishing and all of that, the thing you got to realize is nowadays you have to follow the laws. Like you need a, a license to do that, like to hunt. You need a license to fish. There's limits on how much you can get, right? Like a few, a lot of zones in Minnesota, it's buck only. You can only shoot an adult buck. Um, we're in a either or zone, so we can shoot a doe or a buck. Um, I think we can actually get two deer. I'd have to look uh, next year. I think we, we're allowed to take two. But anyways, um, you have to follow these laws, right? Um, where people in the past, like, like, you know, a couple hundred, 300 years ago that were really living off the land and living in a rural environment, it was open season on everything pretty much, you know, like the Native Americans, like they were opportunistic. They didn't 
oh, they, they weren't, you know, like, oh, we are only going to shoot a deer in November, you know, like if the opportunity pre presented itself, they took it. So it, I'm saying it's not, it was a lot easier, still, it's not easy to live off the land like that, but it was a lot more doable back when there wasn't regulations and laws and stuff, because now you have to follow that stuff, right? You can't just go out, go out and catch as many fish as you want. Um, where to my understanding, like reading mountain men tales and like Native American stuff, like if the fishing was good, they didn't stop at, oh, we got three fish. That's enough for dinner. I mean, they put the smack down on them and they put up a lot of fish, you know, for like the year, like they would hammer them and then they knew how to preserve them and all that. So you could put up a lot of food at once where now, I mean, you'd be doing some serious prison time if you like went about it that way. Um, so it's tougher nowadays because you got to follow the, the the rules and the regulation and it's not just a free-for-all which is good because you got to have I mean you have to have you know rules it, it shouldn't be just open season on everything like we need animals around so um, it's good that we have that but I'm saying it ever if it ever got to the point where like it was all right you know society collapsed it's a free-for-all now it would be a lot more doable than right now because I could just, if I saw a deer go through the yard, I would just kill it and eat it, you know? So, where if I did that today, you know, that's against the law. So, anyways, uh, it's not a free-for-all anymore. So, you got to follow the rules, the regulations, and the bag limits and all that. But if it came to where society collapsed and, you know, it really was the end of days, then it would be a totally different story and it would be... It would be open season and uh, you wouldn't pass up any opportunities um, to put up food. So um, that's kind of that, I guess. Um, so anyways, today in like 2023 in the United States of America, it's you can definitely live off of wild game if you hunt like every season and all that and do quite well. And there's people that do it. Um, but, you know, it's definitely more challenging nowadays because you can only hunt, you know, you can only rifle hunt, you know, two, three weeks out of the year instead of all year round like you would be if you were actually dependent on that for food, right? So, something to think about. So Jennifer asks, do you live at the off-grid house full-time and just go over to the cabin for hunting? Why two homes and do you have a third full-time on-grid dwelling somewhere else? <laughs> uh, no, we do not. We actually live off-grid, no plumbing, no grid power, the whole thing, outhouse, heat with wood, melt snow for water, collect rainwater in the summer. Uh, we actually live this way. Like we're not putting on a show just for YouTube. Um, but it's funny you say that because there is some dude that comments once in a while and he, he calls uh, the cabin or like both the cabins my studio. So he's like, oh, thanks for uh, bringing us to your filming studio. You know, like when are you going to show us your real house? You know, so I think he thinks that we have like an on-grid house somewhere. Um, I don't know about other off-grid channels. I don't really watch a whole lot of them anymore. Uh, but you can definitely tell, like, there's a lot of people that it's just their weekend plays or a lot of the big ones, you can tell that they don't really, um, it, like, like the old saying, you know, it takes one to know one. Um, you can tell when people are kind of, it's like, all right, this is kind of a little more for, like, YouTube rather than, like, the real thing. But my goal, like, when I started this channel was just to always keep it legit and real and like, I'm a real person. I don't have like a YouTube personality. Um, they're just like home videos, you know? Um, I hardly know anything about like videography and editing and stuff. I'm just a guy that like sets up a camera and presses record and goes about my day and then puts it on YouTube. Yeah, it was always important to me and like always my goal to come off like as myself and yeah, just show like our real life and how we live. Um, so yeah, this is actually how we live. This is, we live at 365, you know, 24 seven. Um, and yeah, I can't, I don't know about other channels. I like, there's some that, like I said, are definitely, you can tell like, don't live it full time, like, or just like half the year or, you know, like whatever, but uh, we actually do it uh, full time. <clears throat> and yeah, we're not just doing it for YouTube. And like I've said before in previous videos, um, I was doing off grid stuff long before I ever started a YouTube channel. So like I built a log cabin in Alaska. I lived in a like a tent in Alaska. I had I was living out of my truck when I was up there. So I've I've always lived, I mean, since my early 20s, really rustically and very simple. And a lot of the reasoning behind it is, is it's not even necessarily that like I like I want to be an off-grid like homesteader or like off-grid guy on YouTube or or you know. Um I just always wanted to live simple and cheap and not have to rely on 
you know, making a bunch of money to pay for a, a house. You know, I just was like, okay, I'm going to build, I'm going to live simple. I like the woods. I don't need a lot. I just want to build like a simple cabin and live simple and cheap. So I don't have to, I don't, I don't, I never wanted to have like thousands of dollars of bills hanging over my head every month, you know? Anyways, we were able to live a pretty, a pretty free lifestyle because we went this route. So anyways, um, I've always wanted to show just like what it's like, like, cause there's people that actually want to do it. And I think Bush Radical just did a video on this. He, yeah. Like pretty recently called like off grid living is a lie. Um, go check out that video if you haven't. And he kind of lays it out. Um, I don't watch a whole lot of off grid channels anymore because I live it every day. Um, but I do watch him and his wife, Girl in the Woods, but anyways, yeah, he just did a video on, on kind of on, the, on this subject, like how you can tell that some people are, it's not really realistic, and yeah, how a lot of, a lot of it, it gives people, <clears throat> there is a lot of channels that give people kind of the false reality of what it's like and what it's about, you know, um, so anyways, for, for Sierra, for Sierra and I, it's always been about just simple living, keeping it simple, and owning everything and not owing the bank a lot of money. You know, we wanted to live free and debt free and yeah, have everything paid for. I think there was another question here. I'd have to find, I have to scroll and find it, but somebody asked, would I change anything? And uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I'm, I'm really happy with, honestly, like I'm genuinely happy with how things have turned out and how we've set up our life. Um, because yeah, we just have a lot of freedom and it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to live in a cabin in the woods and not have plumbing and all that, but it set us up pretty nice where we have, we own everything. We don't owe the bank a lot of money and we can stretch a little bit of money a long ways because we don't have like a big like mortgage over our head every month, you know? Um, Kim and Frank asked, do you hunt? Uh, yes, I do. I hunt deer, grouse. I've hunted every, I like just about I mean, most things for sure. Like I turkey hunted, duck hunt. I do all that. I, ha I but mainly, the last couple of years, it's just been deer hunting and grouse hunting, um, pheasant hunting a little bit here and there. We'll go down to southern Minnesota and, and pheasant hunt. But um, I've really been getting into bow hunting. Um, that's a great time of year to be in the woods, you know. And then your season's a lot longer, so uh, grou our uh, deer hunting with a bow gives you a much longer season. So that's a lot of fun. But this year, I, I really want to hunt bears. Uh, there's bears around this cabin. And, I mean, they come in the yard and stuff, like, every year. Um, they're around. And the log cabin has a ton of bears around there. Um, and there's nobody out there. So it'd be an awesome place to, to bait bears and hunt one. And um, bear meat, I've never had it. Um, but people say it's really delicious. You get a lot of fat off of it. And there's, yeah, there's plenty of black bears around the log cabin. So it would be fun to try to take one of those and uh, put up, because, you know, a bear's a big game animal, you know, it's a lot of meat. So uh, I want to try to try to bear hunt this year, but there's a lottery for it, or you have to like apply for a, a tag and then there's like a lottery and you get like randomly selected and, and that sort of thing. So I'm hoping I get one this year. If not, they do do like an over the counter thing. So maybe I can get lucky and get one of those um, after the um lottery but we'll see i want to bear hunt this year that would be um that's that's uh like the last thing that i haven't done yet that i would like to to try uh glenn says i noticed that no matter how cold it seems to be you don't use curtains on the windows uh you must lose a lot of heat by way of the glass yeah probably but um i don't pay for heat you know like it's we have the wood stove and it's as long as i got firewood and the stove's ripping it's pretty nice in here um I'm really bad about keeping it going at night though. Cause I just get, yeah, I just go to bed and it doesn't bother me to wake up to like a kind of cold cabin and then get the fire going. But uh, Sierra has been getting a little uh, annoyed with me lately. Cause I mean, last night it was minus 20 and let the stove go out overnight. And we woke up in the morning and it was definitely nippy in here. Um, but yeah, I don't have a heat bill other than hard work, I guess, getting the firewood. So I just, I don't know. It would help a lot. I should do it. A lot of people shrink wrap their windows or put like that saran wrap or whatever it is you know and that helps a lot um but who knows yeah maybe I'll, I'll, i should try it sometime and see how much of a difference it makes always prepping says do you have an on-grid home somewhere no we do not we live between the two cabins all year round and when we're not so with uh, the two cabin things and living off grid full time so this is our main cabin no plumbing no grid power you know the real like pretty rustic 
And then when we're not here, we go to our cabin, which is even farther out in the woods, away from all that stuff. And then when we're not there, we're in a tent, like we, we go camping. Um, this year we have, just Sierra and I, we'll have like 42 days in the Boundary Waters this year, this summer during paddling season. So that's, you know, a month and a half basically living in a tent. So we live in off-grid cabins year round. And then when we're not at those, we're living in a tent, which is even more rustic. But I've often said that, and I'm not even kidding. I mean, personally, I think that like Boundary Waters camping, which is where, you know, you load up all your stuff in a canoe and then you go out on this chain of lakes. That's true wilderness, like no phone service, not any people. Um, and it's just, it's camping. Um, that I would say that that is actually more, to me, it's actually easier living that way than living like here where we don't have a well and collecting rainwater and melting snow and all that. Because in the Boundary Waters, your your there's water everywhere and it's the water is so clean that you can go paddle out to the middle of the lake and dip your cup in it and drink it without even filtering it like that's why the boundary waters is such a special place and why it's so awesome is it's it's clean water and yeah just having water right on demand there like being able to just dip a, a cup or whatever right into the lake and drink it or what you know use it for washing dishes that's everything that's the thing that a lot of people really overlook when it comes to off-grid living and a lot of people have asked what, if there's one thing that like I, I miss about like on grid living, it's, it's water, like having water on demand, being able to like turn a faucet or like dipping, you know, like having an unlimited supply of water is the best thing in the world. It's, it's everything. And when you live this way and you have to melt snow for your water or collect rainwater, and it's not really a guarantee that you have water and it's very labor intensive to get it. Um, yeah, you do not take water for granted. So in a lot of ways, living in a tent out in the middle of the woods on a lake is easier than living in an off-grid cabin if you're not on a lake. So, so yeah, water's the number one thing you gotta figure out if you're looking to do off-grid living. Probably when it's all said and done out of the year, I'm basically splitting time between living in a tent in the woods and two cabins because I just like being nomadic. I just like not being tied down to one place and I just like adventure. And to me, camping, like I, my biggest passion in life is the woods and wilderness and going on adventures. I love that, you know, like that's more so my passion than off-grid cabin living. Off-grid cabin living just so happens to match up very well with the lifestyle that I want to live because I love being in the woods. So um, people have asked like, oh, is this turning into a camping channel or whatever? Because I show some camping videos once in a while, but no, it's not. There's always going to be cabin content and stuff. Um, but I love sharing the camping and that stuff because that's what, that's my thing. Like that's my hobby and that's what I spend all my free time doing. Mona asked, do you ever plan to move back to Alaska? If so, what area and when? How old is Skeeter? Yeah, I can see myself back in Alaska someday for sure. Um, I, I like the ideal situation would be to if I could spend like half the year there, half the year here. Alaska is one of those places, man. Like it doesn't get much better than that. It's the most beautiful state. There's a ton of freedom there, and it's really hard to explain it unless you've lived there. It's just it's just different. It's it really is the last frontier. Um, yeah, a lot of freedom and just it doesn't get much prettier. Um, so if I could figure out how I could spend half the year there and half the year here, that would be ideal. Um, just cause you know, all my family's here and stuff. So, um, yeah, I do miss Alaska and, and I don't know, I, I would like to at least retire there, but I want to, I mean, at some point soon, it would be awesome to get, um, a little piece of land there and then build a little simple cabin, like just a little, like 12 by 16 cabin, just to have a place to stay when you're there. The problem with Alaska is it's so far away that it's, you know, it's a, it's a haul getting up there. If you're going to drive up there, you're looking at a week drive, money for gas, wear and tear on your truck or your vehicle. Um, if you're not going to drive, then you got to fly. So you're looking at, you know, pretty much a thousand bucks just to get up there and come back. Like, so it's a lot of money to get there. Um, it's not like, you know, having a cabin or, or, or like traveling to a, like one state over it's, you're going halfway across the world. So it's, it, it takes a lot of money to get there and back. So that's the issue with that. But yeah, I miss Alaska big time. Definitely want to get back there. 
Uh, becoming a man says, do you ever feel lonely or feel like you're missing out on life? I do not, no. I think, I think I could flip that question back at a lot of people. I think a lot of people are missing out on, on this life, you know? Not, not that a lot of people want to live in the woods, but yeah, I, I can't do the concrete jungle. I really can't. Like, I just, I don't feel comfortable in a city or like a town. Um, I like having space. I like... I just feel like like uh, being in the woods, everything makes sense. There's no drama. There's no politics. There's no worries. You just work hard and produce things for yourself. And yeah, I just love, I love the simplicity of it. You know, like just sitting by a campfire, that's like in the woods, you know, hearing the sounds of nature. I mean, that's just, it doesn't get much better than that for me. So I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Steve says, what happened to the Vikings this year? Well, they do what the, the Vikings do. They're, uh, yeah, we're the, we're the best mediocre team that's ever existed. Um, yeah, that's, this we're just the Vikings. Love, love the Vikings, though. Well, all right, I think that's enough. I don't know, I'm sure this is, it feels like it's getting to be kind of long, so I'm going to end this here. Maybe I'll pick up with this at the end of another video that needs a little filler. Um, but... As always, I appreciate you guys watching. Um, to, if I didn't respond to your question on this video, I'll try to reply to you in the um, community post here. But yeah, I, I appreciate the support. And anyways, like I said, I mean, the, like this channel is just all about, it's like home videos, right? Like I don't go out of my way to like, oh, I need to make a video today. You know, should I build a wood fired hot tub or something? Um, that's not my style. I just want to like show people that, if you want to do this and have like financial freedom and live simple and cheap, I want to like show people that it's very doable. You don't need a lot of money to do it. You just got to kind of play your cards right and be okay with giving up a few things to have more freedom, I guess is what it comes down to. So anyways, I just, yeah, I like showing that I'm a regular guy and um, that this is our life. Yeah. I just like showing our, our life with you guys. So um, thanks for watching and, uh, I will see you guys soon.